Welcome to K-State Online. I'm Mason Voth. That is Drew Calloway. We are back yet again to talk some K-State football, spring ball underway, all that fun stuff going on. And throughout the spring, obviously, there will be some news and notes that come up, so we'll certainly hit on those. But it's also a time that is rich with speculation, and it's a little different under Chris Kleiman than what the last few years of Bill Snyder was because it feels like we were trying to talk ourselves into like a bunch of mediocre guys that probably were never going to see the field and be like, well, you know, this guy could be something or guys that had loads of hype, but for one reason or the other, uh, were just never good. Uh, I think the only guy that ever lived up to the, the preseason hype was Seabass, Jabaston Taylor, uh, <laughs> Megatron, as those in the know called him. Um, so with that in mind, we won't talk about like the entire roster here, but it might be more interesting to discuss some of the younger guys on the roster. Because as we know, in the last couple of years, there's been a pretty heavy influx of highly sought after guys in the recruiting ranks and also local guys that obviously there's a ton of interest in. Um, It feels like we're probably going on year number 17 of people asking where Sterling Lockett every other week. Uh, I think he's ineligible for this at this point. He might be aging out of the young category. Uh, But Drew, out of the young guys on this roster, and you can quantify young any way you want to, uh, who are some guys that need to make some noise this offseason that would tell you either about their development and give you a good feeling moving forward or dudes that might even be able to see the field? Uh, The first one, I'm going to start with the offense, is kind of an obvious one. I I feel like it it has to be either – it has to be one of the running backs and like I'll, I'll just single out Joe Jackson as the guy because he has already been on campus uh, and has, he played in the SEMO game and went throughout all the year last year. And we didn't really get to see him outside of the SEMO game at all. So I'm interested to see kind of where he's at because he's an important piece because K-State doesn't really have a lot behind DJ Giddens that's proven. So you would like to see him take a step because then as a member of the Davon Rice fan club, I'd, I'd still like to see Rice be able to kind of acclimate into just being in college for a little bit and then kind of slowly bring him along if Jackson can really find that next gear. Uh, the other offensive one that I have pointed out, and I feel like I'm kind of stealing the, the other one that is kind of just the out there one of, oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> is Trace Fivey because he just looks a lot different than a lot of K-State receivers that they've had in the past and just moves differently. And with the offense kind of moving to a more simplistic, hey, like you're good at this, like let's keep doing that and get you on the field. I feel like he's the one that would really be the beneficiary at wide receiver. So, I mean, those are my two big ones on offense because I I think that at quarterback, like – I don't consider Avery Johnson to be a young player at this point anymore. Yeah, he's he's young, but in terms of what we're looking for, I think Avery Johnson's already made plenty of noise. Uh, if if you think about that, I those are obviously I think the two best options offensively. Trey Spivey, I think, is probably to me he's the number one just because of like you said the body and some of the background on Trey Spivey that would get people excited. And we saw him last year, like you talked about Joe Jackson, in the SEMO game. We saw Trey Spivey in that game and Avery Johnson hooked up with him a couple of times and, and they made some plays there. So I think that's probably the one that I'm most excited. In. Another name though, that I would throw out offensively uh, because this is one that would go in the category of like Trey Spivey and Joe Jackson. If they make noise, we're probably seeing them on the field this year. Yeah. But I would throw Andre Davis, another receiver, into that category because the size is there, and the noise you get from him may not put him on the field this season, but it would at least start to put it into the back of your head, okay, this is a legitimate option moving forward because I think that's one of those things. Like He's getting into that territory of we need to start to hear his name come up uh, to to give some hope for what could come out of that in the future, and if that's the case, then K-State's going to have a really strong receiving room Uh, by year three of Avery Johnson in 2025, and you've done it with all these guys that came in at the same time because Jace Brown is already with these dudes. So I think that's the other that I would throw into uh, the the group and and maybe see what they can do from there. In terms of like looking around and, and trying to figure if there's anybody from this year that I would throw into that category, there's really not a ton offensively because 
the offensive guys they brought in, a majority of them were offensive linemen. And we just know that like, it's, it's far too early to start to think anything needs to come out of these offensive linemen. Um, so I think it'll just kind of be fun to follow along with and see, uh, how, how they develop, but I, I'm not saying that we need to hear, Oh, this guy's <laughs> doing this right now. Like, uh, no, Gus Hawkins can have uh, a little bit of time to acclimate. Uh, I don't, I don't need Kyle Rakers to be ready to play game one, you know? So we'll, we'll see how that stuff plays out. But I think the two receivers and certainly Joe Jackson is a big one because I mean, you talk to some people, I mean, D.Y. I think is already leaning more towards Devon Rice maybe being the second running back that gets maybe the most touches behind D.J. Giddens this year. So that's another thing that leads me to believe, hey, we need some Joe Jackson noise uh, to, to get things rolling. And I think it's a, a strong possibility because Brian Anderson has kind of flexed his muscle at the running back position since he's been here. Yes. Uh, that's been a position that K-State has not lacked any of the years that Chris Kleiman has been here. And it's really significant last year and what they did in year number one as well, because you kind of felt like maybe they were lost at those positions, but year one, they brought in a great transfer group to, and James Gilbert and Jordan Brown to carry them through. And then you had Deuce Vaughn, obviously you did great stuff, but we knew DJ Giddens was good last year. I think he was even better than what we would have anticipated for his first full year as a starter. And that's because they had him ready to go for that role. And now you hope that they're uh, able to start to do that with some of the guys behind DJ this year. I, I think people are gonna kill me for this, like uh, like what you said about Khalid Duke's career. I think the the one guy that I think I'm probably the most disappointed with that Brian Anderson's brought in was Trayshawn Ward. I, I just I, I thought that he'd provide a little bit more wiggle than like what you had with DJ Giddens, and it just seemed like it never clicked with Ward for whatever reason. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the the running back success rate that K-State's had right now is just rolling right now. I think I think Trayshawn Ward worked out well enough for what K State needed him to be, but you know, as evidenced by the fact that Trayshawn Ward transferred after the year to go to Boston College, Trayshawn Ward got here and DJ Giddens was probably even better than he thought and ran away with that job as the number one back. And and I, I don't know that it was intentional on Trayshawn Ward's part, but I think that there would be the you know the option to say you didn't get the full Trayshawn war that you could have because of the circumstances. And you know, it, it worked out for K-State. They're, they're going to yeah. be fine there. It's unfortunate. They don't have that depth because I do think that the benefit of Trayshawn Ward was he did provide a little something different at times. And if you had those games where, Hey, it's just not DJ Ginn's night. You have an option to actually go to a guy though, that could be a starter and and do those things like the Texas Tech game. He helped K-State out big. He had a big run against KU that helped out in that game. So we'll see how it works. Defensively, this one is opened up to a lot of different guys because there are a lot of options here. And again, it's a good bl blend of, hey, highly sought after dudes, but also some local guys that people are interested in. So who do you have defensively out of the youth movement? Uh, my, my first guy is actually a, a local and highly sought after guy, uh, Jordan Allen. I, I just think that there's a lot of depth at defensive end, like almost like I'm really intrigued to see what they do at defensive end because they have so many now this year compared to last year that I think are able to see the field. But I think that he probably has the highest ceiling out of the younger players at the defensive end position. So if he can per come in and have a nice spring, summer, I feel like he could really take off and really kind of set the tone of like this youth movement on defense because it's an experienced defense, but there's also some younger players that are behind that you're like, that are behind some of the older guys that you really want to see like Jordan Allen. And then uh, my second guy, I, I might be still on another one of your guys here, uh -oh. uh, is coming off of an injury. And I, I'm interested to see how Asa Newsom progresses throughout the spring and summer, because if he can get to a point where he's healthy enough to play week one, that would be big for K-State. They have a bunch of linebackers, but it's a bunch of guys that it's kind of like up in the air of what to expect out of some of them. So if he can come along and be ready week one, I think that like Jordan Allen, I think that he has the highest ceiling out of any of the linebackers in the room currently. Yeah, and that's a good one because – he played a little bit early on last year and it did seem like he was going to get some better playing time than maybe anticipated going into the season. And then the injury happens. So you kind of miss out on that. And, and now, you know, he's battling back from being young, but also being 
hurt. So it'll be fascinating to watch how that goes. But I mean, he's a dude defensively that you can project to be a pretty talented player. Uh, he, he, he was a, a four star when all was said and done, uh, according to on three, uh, in the 2023 class. So that's, that's certainly one. I think that's probably a big one for a lot of people, uh, that, that are on the, the top of, of their list and everything else. I wonder, you know, I'm not saying that this is a guy that you're just looking around saying, we got to hear something about him, but we saw a decent amount of Jack for Brees last year. And he just profiles as a guy that like is going to be able to, he's going to be a really smart player for you. And if you need to plug him in somewhere, he's going to be able to do it. I already envision that's a guy that we hear his name get dropped multiple times this spring. And like, he's probably not going to wow anybody with his athleticism, but he probably falls into that, that, you know, group again, of guys that K-State produces, it seems like every couple of years that they know how to play the game and the coaches can trust them. And somehow, some way, they find a way way to make plays despite the fact that they may not have uh, what people would normally expect a playmaker to, to have. So I would throw that out there as as one of them just because of what we saw last year where he was already on the field with a pretty solid defense. And, and we heard about Jack Fabris all of the summer, it felt like it. It seemed like every press conference that he was one of the big or one of the freshmen that was being mentioned the most. So, I mean, I, I think that he's someone, too, that he played in his four games and they shut him down. So I'm really interested to see how he progresses because, I mean, like you said, like it, it, it's hard for a player to play the position that he does at the jack safety and be able to play as a freshman. So I I, I was impressed just by that last year. Yeah. Uh, any other defensive guys out there? Because we know like the – the most recent class, there wasn't a load of defensive players in it. And so 2023, where you would be drawing from, but we've already hit on probably the, the key guys there. N not a younger guy per se because of age, but I think a younger guy in terms of time and the program, I, I would like to hear something about Tyler Nalom mm -hmm. during, during the spring and summer because he's somebody that, behind Keenan Garber and um, Jacob Parrish, you don't really know what you have at corner. And you brought him in last year and he played in one game. So you wonder just what he has there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good call to, to kind of see what is going to come out. Cause I mean, that's, that's a class of 2020 guys. So he's been around a while in all of this, but you do wonder, okay, how has the development actually played out and what is it going to look like if he's on the field? And you need to develop some guys in that position. Uh, any Anybody else that you think you're not expecting it necessarily, but they're maybe starting to, to get close to that time where if we're not hearing something about you, then maybe there should be a little bit of concern? Um, I don't know about even concern really, but it's kind of on the same lines of Tyler Nalome where – I'd like to hear something about Daniel Cobbs because the safety depth is also kind of unproven. So if he can take a jump and be able to see the field, it would be a big for K state. So it's, it's a big off season and spot in summer for the guys that are like the sophomore juniors that we haven't really heard anything about yet that we just aren't sure what they have. And K state probably needs at least a few of them to be able to see the field. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see how uh, it ends up coming about for the Wildcats, but certainly uh, options with young guys. Uh, and now it's just up to see how they kind of take it and run with it. Cause there are opportunities with the way K state's roster is set up right now for these guys to, to step up. And the, the possibilities are kind of endless for them at this point. So that will do it for us for Drew Galloway. I'm Mason both head over to K state online at on three to get a little bit more K state news for your team or recruiting updates and also preparations for K-State's regular season finale in basketball against Iowa State tomorrow. So that will do it for Drew and I. We are out of here. Thanks for watching.